Welcome uh, to the second uh, lecture on uh, the semantic web, think data and data on the web in, uh, in general. And uh, today we are going to talk about uh, the RDF data model and its serializations. Uh, last time we introduced the four principles of uh, linked data. Those were the principles that uh, enabled us as data publishers uh, to publish data in a way that is easier to consume uh, and uh, that is more usable and uh, hopefully will be as usable as uh, the web of documents is today when we want to basically read text uh, on web pages. And the four principles were use your eyes as names for things, the URIs need to be HTTP URIs, so that when someone actually tries to look up the URI, uh, they get information and the information should be in uh, a standard format, which is RDF. I introduced RDF a little bit, but today we are going to go uh, deeper. Uh, and um, the fourth principle said that uh, we need to add context, which meant that uh, basically when you send data about an entity to someone, um, according to the third principle, you should also include links to other relevant data that you know of. Um, and the parallel is uh, uh, basically with the data, uh, with the web of documents that you have links on your web pages that also points to other relevant web pages and the links were put there by the author of the web page. So this is the same, uh, but, for, uh, but for data. And therefore, we created the web of data where we had the individual entities identified by URIs and their, uh, their relations, where edges in the graph also identified by URIs. Uh, and it didn't matter uh, whether this entity is uh, published by uh, the same publisher as the other entity. Uh, we don't care as long as all the four principles are met. Before we get to the actual uh, data model, RDF, and its serialization, uh, we need to talk about the identifiers used uh, on uh, the web of uh, data. And uh, I already mentioned URIs, URLs, IRIs, and uh, maybe I mixed them up a little bit in the introduction. So let's uh, be clear about what each of those means. So basically, we have four. Uh, similar acronyms for the identifiers used on the web. We have URIs, URMs, URLs, and IRIs. Uh, and uh, well, RDF itself is based on IRIs, but before we get to that, we need to uh, make sure that we are clear on uh, what, which of those acronyms actually means what, because the meanings are different, even though later we will basically almost always talk about either IRIs or URLs it's good to know what the differences are. And we'll start with the basic one, which is a URI. Uh, it is defined by an IRC, which is a web standard, but basically URI is a string that looks something like what we can see here. Uh, and it is just that, it is a string which serves as an identifier. This means that when we see two such strings, we can see whether those strings are the same or not. And therefore, we can say, OK, they identify different things or they identify the same thing. And that's it. That's all there is to it. Plus, there is this syntax. So that's a URI. There is no um, other functionality included. Specifically, the functionality that you can take this URI and use it in a web browser to actually get the identified thing from the internet is not included in uh, URI. So you uh, maybe can do that, uh, but uh, you are not guaranteed that it will work. When you are guaranteed that this will work, then we are talking about URLs where we have locator and we have the second function uh, included that when we use this ID, this IRI um, or URI, we actually can use it in a web browser or with the HTTP protocol to find that identified thing on the web and download its representation. So that's a, a URL locator, which has two functions, identification function and the location function. Now, um, the original URIs, um, they are US ASCII based, which means that all the characters uh, in the string 
uh, only English, US English, from the US English alphabet, they cannot contain international characters, emojis, and so on. IRIs are a step towards uh, including Unicode in uh, the identifiers, but uh, the important thing here is that IRIs can include the Unicode characters only in the past part, which is here, this uh, little thing here. Uh, not in the domain name, that's another technique, and uh, the query and fragment, well, you can use those there, uh, but uh, that is not what IRI is about. So IRI means an identifier, not a locator, uh, with Unicode characters in the past part. And when we talk about URLs, we actually do not know whether the URLs are based on URIs or IRIs. So there is this little uh, this little confusion, and then we have uh, URNs. URNs are special a special kind of URIs. They look like this, uh, and uh, they start with the URN scheme. Maybe I could talk a little bit about the syntax of the actual URI. So uh, each um, URI starts with a scheme part, which is this uh, up to the colon here, uh, and uh, that determines how the rest of the URI will actually look like. So there are some internet-based uh, or web-based URIs that look something like this. So HTTP, FTP, HTTPS, and so on. So they have uh, the authority part, which is the domain name or, or an IP address and a port number, then the path, then some query parameters, if you're actually calling a web service or something like that, and a fragment, which uh, serves as a navigation inside the retrieved document or um, piece of, uh, of data. But not all URIs look like this. An example of such uh, URI is URN. So here we have the scheme uh, URN, but then we have um, several parts separated by a, a colon. And uh, one interesting thing about URNs is that you can actually register this first part for yourself in this IANA URN namespace registry. So this registry contains registered first part of URNs, and uh, then you can do whatever you want with the rest. Uh, URNs have the property that they are specifically not bound to a location, whether uh, or uh, in contrast to URIs, because URIs are based on domain names and domain names are registered to organizations uh, that reside somewhere or the domains have um, some regional uh, relation. So we have uh, our national CZ uh, uh, top level domain and that is connected to the Czech Republic and, and so on. So URNs are specifically not bound to any particular location. Uh, there are other uh, examples of URIs. So here we have the uh, FTP, HTTP and uh, similar URIs, but the different ones are URNs and uh, for instance, mail to, which is a URI representation of an email address, a tel uh, URI, uh, a representation of a telephone number, and so on. Um, when it comes to representing email addresses and telephone numbers in your data in RDF, remember these two, because I will want you to represent those as URIs, not just uh, strings. Okay, and uh, coming back to IRIs, there is one, uh, little problem with IRIs, and that is that uh, when we are talking about the web and the HTTP protocol, uh, the HTTP protocol is based on URIs, the US ASCII uh, version of the identifiers. However, RDF is based on IRIs. So in RDF, we are actually encouraged to use the Unicode versions of the identifiers. But then we have the third principle of linked data saying that when someone actually asks for representation of that identifier of that IRI, we should return some data. So we need to use it as a URL with the HTTP protocol. Now, how do we do that? Well, there is a, an encoding. So we can take the Unicode representation of an IRI and encode it, specifically percent encode it uh, into a URI that looks like this. The Unicode encoding means that uh, each character or symbol is uh, encoded uh, as up to four bytes. And it is a variable length encoding. So some symbols have just a one byte encoding 
and some have four bytes like uh, emojis and this percent encoding does um, well it represents each byte separately as a percent symbol and then a hexadecimal representation of that byte of that symbol that's why emojis for bytes this one has this representation when uh, they are a uh, person encoded um, and uh, of course when we see a uri like this we can again encode it back to unicode and see it as it was meant to be seen now um, there is one uh, one um, uh, additional technology involved in unicode in uh, iris and that is idn internationalized domain name it is possible for some top level domains to actually have unicode characters in uh, the domain name but this is a different technology than iri because we are not talking about the path path we are talking about the domain name and there is also a mapping to us ascii but this one looks a lot different than the percent encoding and it looks like this so this is the domain name that you actually need to register uh, with your dns provider when you want to have a, a domain name with the unicode characters and typically implementations working with rdf should somehow consider or implement both encoding punicode for idn part uh, for, for the, the domain name part of the uris or iris and uh, person encoding for the path part of the iris um, i am mentioning this because these two things can cause some problems with some implementations in some settings so it is good to know what the problem actually can be right so this was the part about your eyes i rise your ends your else I hope you are now clear on uh, which is which. And uh, let's get back to uh, RDF. Um, so RDF is a data model. It is a graph shape data uh, model. We have uh, nodes and edges. Um, edges connect the nodes and nodes are identified by IRIs and edges uh, as well. And uh, the entire graph can be split into uh, triples. Uh, also sometimes known as statements because they actually are simple statements and the triples or statements have three parts a subject a predicate and an object and this is an example so Jakub Klimek studied at Charles University three parts of the triple of the statement um, now if we are talking about the graph representation of data we are talking about the graph data model however today we'll see techniques how to actually represent that graph in a text file that can be sent over the internet or stored somewhere uh, on uh, on a disk or something like that and those are called uh, serializations or syntaxes and there are seven standard serializations of the rdf data model some are connected to other data formats such as xml or json uh, uh, or html in the case of rdfa and the other four are native for rdf so they are not connected to any other uh, data format so let's start talking about rdf and let's start from the simplest thing that we can and that is one single statement here we have a, a statement a triple three parts and all three parts here are identified by iris this means that there is a, a thing identified by this iri from the looks of it it seems like a web page um, there is a relation identified by this iri now we may not know what this particular relation means but i can tell you that this means that something is created by someone and the third iri here probably identifies some employee of some company and when we read it uh, it means that this web page was created by this person so again a simple statement with three parts uh, each part identified by an IRI. Uh, there is also a graphical representation because we are talking about a graph based data model. So those um, entities identified by IRIs are these ovals here, and the edge is the predicate, the, um, the relation, and identified by the IRI. So we have a subject, a predicate, or an object. Sometimes we call the predicate a property. 
And those things identified by IRIs are called things or resources. So we have resources connected by a property, subject, predicate, object, and the whole thing is a triple or a statement. Now, uh, if we only had the type of statement that I just showed you, there would be no place where to actually put things like name or names of people, dates, and uh, uh, other simple values. Uh, so that is not the only type of triple. There is a, another type of NRDF triple, which has uh, this simple value at the object position. And this is called a literal. So this is a literal value and it can contain or assign to this, uh, to this subject a simple value like a string or a number or a date or something like that. So here we have the graphic representation and literals are um, represented as, uh, well, rectangles. So here we have a thing, the web page identified by this URI, then the relation. So the subject of the web page is this, and this is a literal string containing uh, the value education. And again, subject, predicate, object. This is a resource, this is a literal, and the whole thing is a statement or a triple. Now, because those URIs are long, I will shorten them using prefixes. So I will define a prefix like this, name it, and then I'll say that this name I will use in the text to denote this part of the URI. And then when I actually use this, this name of the prefix, there will be a colon here. And what is after the colon will be, uh, well, added to the prefix. And like this, I will get a full URI. Uh, but I will save some space um, by, doing, by doing this. So this URI is the same as this one. And I will, uh, I will say URI, IRI, URL, but I always basically, almost always mean IRI or um, IRI based URL. Um, right. There is a service, prefix.cc, uh, that you can use whenever you are in the situation that uh, you see the prefix name, but you are not sure about the definition. Uh, the, the, the URI prefix. Um, this can happen when you see a documentation of some data or when you, are, when you need to write a query that you know this part, but you do not know the definition. Then you can go to this service and use it with the name that you know, and it will give you the definition of the prefix. So this is a nice service to know about. Uh, right. So uh, let's go further and we'll have more than one triple. We'll have three triples here. We'll have the page and we can see it's prefixed, but still uh, full URIs, full IRIs, uh, full, full triples. So here we have the page as a creator, a subject and a language like this. This is actually not uh, well, an ideal representation still, but we are getting there. And there is a graphical representation that goes with it. So we have the page, a creator, a subject, and a language. And we have three triples like this. What's important here to say is that uh, the RDF data model is a set of triples. A set means there is no ordering among those triples. So I cannot say that this triple is the first triple or that this triple is the first triple. I cannot say that. Uh, there is no ordering. So it's just a set of statements. Um, on an example like this one, it may seem unimportant, but uh, there can be another example where we have a page and it has one creator and then it will have another creator. So there will be multiple creators of the web page, and it may be important to uh, somehow record which one is the first creator, which one is the last creator, uh, but this is not the way to do it. Uh, there is no ordering among those, uh, those triples. Right, uh, let's talk about uh, the literal values a little bit more. Um, so far, we have seen that those are strings basically and nothing more. Uh, it's not that simple. The literal values have two parts. The first part is the string value of that literal, but then 
there is an indication of the data type of that string. In this case, we have a date, and here we have the, the, the IRI of a data type used for representing dates. Now, the data types are used from the XML schema language used in XML. Uh, that's why typically the data types have the XSD prefix. If you take a look at uh, the specification of the XML schema language, there is a tree of data types defined, and those are the data types that are used in RDF, as well as JSON, CSV, and other data formats. Um, so coming back to RDF literals, uh, they typically look something like this. There is the string representation, and then I arrive of the data type. So that the application processing the data knows how to actually treat the value. And that is not the only uh, type of literal we have in RDF. There is another one for texts. Because we are on the web, whenever we have a text value, so something readable by people in some natural language, um, there is a native support in RDF to actually represent which language the text uses. So here, this text is in English. And therefore, we have this at en. En is an ISO code for English. And the at symbol um, represents that this is something called a language tag. It specifies the language of the text. And then it looks like this. It is, again, a literal that has two parts, the text and the, the string. And then, in this case, the indication of the natural language. So two types of RDF literals. One readable by machines with a data type indicated by its IRI, or a text readable by humans with the language indicated. When you see a literal that has neither of those, so no data type or no uh, language tag, there is a default that says that it is a string, a machine readable string. However, when this uh, literal with no language tag contains a human readable text, it is typically a mistake to uh, have it as denoted as a machine readable string. There should always be a language tag or a data type indicated. Right, so yeah, those are the two uh, types of triples and two types of literals that can occur in an RDF triple. Uh, there are some special predicates. We already saw those in the introductory um, lecture where I basically said we have a thing and that thing is a public contract. Now we have a thing and this thing is a person. Uh, and this kind of statement is so common that there is a predicate established just for this type of a statement. And that predicate is RDF type. Uh, it says exactly that. So we have a thing identified by this URI, it's a resource. And that resource is of a type. And now we need to say, what type? And because the type is also a thing, it is again identified by an IRI, it is a resource. But because it is used for typing stuff, it's also uh, called a class. So this is similar to uh, object-oriented programming where we have objects and those objects are of a certain type and the type is the class. So uh, this is the class. We can uh, look at this <clears throat> in a, um, in another way based on a set theory. So we have an individual here and this individual belongs to a class of all those individuals which means that this thing is actually a set of all people. And every person is therefore part of this set. So those are two different views of the same thing, uh, of the RDF type predicate. When you are uh, going to write your own data in RDF, this statement is typically the first thing you want to write. So you establish an IRI for something you want to publish, and you say, okay, it is of a type, and you say what type it is, and then you say, yeah, and because it's a person, they have first name, last name, and so on. But this is typically the first thing you want to say. Right. Uh, since we are introducing RDF as a data model, there are some things that you may encounter that are not totally uh, recommended to be used, but 
it may happen. One of those things is a node like this, a node that is not identified by any identifier, any IRI. This is called a blank node because it is not identified by anything. Uh, and uh, you can spot a blank node in the RDF serialization uh, when the serialization supports prefixes, such as RDF turtle, we will talk about that, um, by this underscore prefix. The underscore prefix is a special prefix used for blank nodes. And now, <clears throat> since the individual triples uh, need to somehow say or indicate that they uh, relate to the same node, and we cannot use the IRI of that node because there is no IRI, there still needs to be some kind of identifier. So there is this identifier, a local identifier of the blank node. In this case, it's A1, uh, and it serves just one purpose. Uh, within the given RDF document, set of triplets, uh, it basically indicates which, um, well, which objects and subjects are the same blank node. Um, so here we can see that we have a person, the person has address, the address is a blank node. And then we want to say, and the address has a zip code, a city, a street, and so on. And because we do not have an IRI, we need to use this local identifier like this. And then we can say, yeah, there is a street, there is a city, there is a zip code, and they all belong to this blank node, which is the same blank node as the one that is used as an address of the employee. Um, <clears throat> the important thing to note about blank nodes is that since those are local IDs, they will change when you actually take the data and, for instance, load it in an application and save it again, then those IDs will be different because they are local to just the document. If there is something that uh, bothers you, then you probably should have used an IRI and not a blank note. Right, um, next, uh, we need to talk about the ordering of things because I uh, talked about uh, the case where you have a document, maybe a book with a set of authors and there is uh, a natural ordering among those authors. But if you just say a book has an author, author one, a book has an author, author two, and so on. Um, well, there is no actual ordering among those triples. So you will lose this information, which author is the first one, which is the second one. Um, and this needs to be addressed somehow. The way it is addressed in RDF is by this data structure. Uh, if you take a look at it, um, here we have, let's say a book, which has an author. And here we point to this node here. This node is a list of a type, RDF list. This is a special RDF type. The list has a first item, let's say, this will be the first author. Then there is a link to the rest of the list and that's it. The rest of the list is again a list with the first item, this will be the second author and the rest. And the rest here, in case of two authors of a book is RDF nil, which is a special kind of a list, which is an empty list. So this may remind you of a linked list data structure from basic programming. And it is just that it is a linked list data structure. And you can use it to establish ordering among uh, things in RDS. Uh, one, another property of this list is that it is closed. It ends with RDF nil. If it does not end with RDF nil, it is invalid, but uh, it ends with RDF nil, which means that if you want to add something into this list, you need to change the existing, um, well, last list to actually point to another thing. And that will be the edit thing, uh, which is <coughs> a more complex operation than just adding a triple with another thing. That can be done, but there is another data structure for that. This data structure is actually not used in RDF as often. But just in case you come across it, um, you can have something that looks like this. You have the representation of a set, uh, a collection, um, and then there is a RDF prefix and underscore one, underscore two, underscore three, and so on. 
and you can point to multiple items like this and then you say this collection is of a type and you have three options either either you say it's a bag which is just another word for a set and therefore well nothing happened uh, you still do not have any uh, any ordering among those things or you say it's a sequence then you do have the ordering or you say it's a representation of alternatives well <clears throat> when you take a look at the data structure you still use the underscore one two and three and so on so um, the only place where your application processing the data can actually understand what is happening is from the type of this thing whether it is a bag or a sequence or an, an alternative so it is up to the application to actually process the data in the way indicated by the type here and maybe this is one of the reasons why it is not used that often but if you want to add a, a thing to this collection you just add another triple and that's it it is therefore an open collection Right, so enough of uh, the technicalities of the RDF data model. Uh, this is more or less it. We didn't talk about the serializations yet, we will. But uh, from the point of view of the data model, this is it. Um, RDF is a web standard. The first version from 2004, there was a slight update involving the usage of IRIs, uh, among others from 2014. It is a graph data model and you can uh, sometimes see it defined as a directed labeled multigraph because all the predicates are directed from the subject to the object they are labeled by the iri of the predicate and it is a multigraph because two nodes can have multiple um, predicates connecting them so directed labeled multigraph right so uh, let's talk about how we can represent this graph uh, data uh, in uh, text and uh, the most straightforward way is representing it just like this a list of triples where the triple is either three uri or three iris or two iris and a literal a literal either with a language tag or with an iri of a data type that's it um there is one specialty here and that is that you can have comments um and uh, well at the end of the triple there is a uh, dot like this so this serialization is called n triples it is very simple and you can serialize any rdf graph like this uh, the advantages are it is simple so it is very easy to read uh, very easy to write and uh, it is also easy tr to transmit over the web because uh, you can um, basically split it into chunks and send it uh, and uh, the receiver just uh, puts all the chunks together and has the whole serialization nothing more is required um, it is not very human readable if you'll see uh, many triples serialized like this you will not want to read it or try to understand what is in the data uh, but from the machine readability point of view uh, it's okay it is also uh, quite space intensive so if you do not use compression it will take up a uh, lot of space to represent uh, uh, the, the data like this yeah but uh, we do not want to use this uh, serialization unless we have special reasons to uh, and therefore let's do some optimizations one of the optimizations uh, so let's have these five triples uh, about the web page and we'll try to represent them in a uh, smarter way let's say um, and uh, this smarter serialization is called RDF turtle and one of the techniques used there we already know and that's prefixing so at the beginning of the turtle uh, document we'll have the prefixes used throughout the document defined um, and uh, this will make the serialization of uh, the triples shorter as we can see here because those were the original five triples those are the same five triples but they are shorter they are more readable so those are prefixes uh, but still um, for instance when we take a look here uh, at the index html subject we can see that all five triples are about the same subject and uh, we repeat this subject all the time so <clears throat> let's do something about that we 
we'll introduce a semicolon. And semicolon at the end of a triple means that the next triple has the same subject, only the uh, predicate and the object is, uh, is different. <clears throat> but then again, here we have the creator twice, the title twice. Let's do, let's do something about that as well. And we'll introduce a comma. And a comma means that the subject is the same, the predicate is the same, just the object is different for the next triple. Um, so like this, we have, again, the same five triples with prefixes, uh, semicolons, and commas used. And now we can see that actually this forms kind of a paragraph of text that is more readable than before. And if you get used to, um, to some of the vocabularies used here, because the prefix names correspond to vocabularies, sets of class definitions and predicate definitions for a certain domain, um, you will see that this kind of serialization is really more human readable and writable uh, than uh, in triples. Now, uh, talking about prefixes, prefixes do not always have to have a name. So you can find a prefix with no name here. And when you use it, you do not necessarily need to put anything after the prefix. So uh, when you combine those two, you can have a prefix with no name and nothing after it, and it is still uh, a representation of a full uh, IRI. So here we have two triples, and the same two triples are here on the right-hand side of the slide, um, and they are basically the usage of, uh, of the prefixes with or without the name and with or without something added to the prefix. Right, so we talked about um, prefixed URI. There is another kind of shortcut that can be used um, that is distinct from prefixed URIs. Uh, and this is relative URIs. Uh, relative URIs use a base and then all the URIs um, that are shortened use this base and add to the base whatever is in the, uh, in the URI here. The difference between a relative URI and a prefix URI is that you can have multiple prefixes defined. And then when you use those prefix URIs, you choose which prefix to use. There is only one base. Uh, and uh, therefore, well, it is, uh, it is advantageous to use uh, relative URIs whenever there is just one base URL or base URI and all, all the shorter URIs use this base. There can be a combination, we'll see it in a minute, but uh, um, from the RDF serialization user uh, perspective, there is also a syntactic difference. When you see a prefix URI, you see no uh, these lower than and greater than signs surrounding it. And by that, you, you can know that this is a prefix URI. On the other hand, when you see a URI that is inside those lower than and uh, greater than characters, it either starts with a scheme, HTTP, HTTPS, and so on, then it is a absolute URI, or it doesn't, and then it is a relative URI, and then you need to know the base in order to get the full URI. So those are two things that you may encounter in RDF serializations, relative URIs and prefix URIs. Um, right, there are some special syntax features. For instance, in Turtle, you can have a string that is actually a multi-line string, um, and you can support it by uh, these triple double quotes. So when you see triple double quotes, you can use new lines within the string. The other special characters still need to be escaped. So those special characters are the usual ones. Uh, well, new lines when you do not use this one, but then the quotes and lower than, greater than, and back, uh, backslash, and, uh, and so on. So those are uh, escapes. Now, back to the RDF type predicate used to assign a type to a thing or a class to a thing. It is so common <laughs> that it actually has a syntax shortcut in the RDF turtle serialization. So whenever you see the a uh character in the place of the predicate, it actually is the RDF type predicate that assigns a class to a thing. 
So here we have the web page, which is of a type for document that's a class for documents on the web. And the same triple can be written in RDF Turtle like this. So we have the web page with a for document. Why it is a? Well, because in English you say this is a for document. That's why it is a. Then we talked about the blank nodes and uh, the necessity to actually establish local IDs for the blank nodes so that we know um, which triplets go together about that blank node. And there is a syntactic uh, solution to this necessity in RDF Turtle. When you, whenever you see these brackets, those represent a blank node. So typically uh, you see them uh, used at the object part of the triple. Here we have something representing a V card, which is the piece of paper you give to someone when you want to give them uh, your contact information. So this is a V card and on the V card, there is an address again, and the address is a blank node. Okay, so the address is a blank node and therefore within those brackets, we see only predicates and objects because the subject is a blank node. Uh, and it is an equivalent to this when we would actually establish the local ID and use it consistently in the triples. There are additional shortcuts for data types, for the common data types used on the web. So normally you would have numbers represented as this. So a literal in double quotes, then two carats, and then an IRI of the data type. Uh, in this case, representing an integer. In RDF Turtle, there is a shortcut for that. When you do not use the double quotes and you just use the number, all applications and parcels know that this is an integer. The same goes for decimal numbers. When there is a decimal dot, the uh, floating point numbers when there is an exponent, and there is a shortcut for uh, Boolean values when it's true or false. Um, so in those cases, you can save. Um, this um, this indication of the data type, but it is there. Another thing is the RDF list, which preserves the ordering of uh, values, such as ordering of authors of a book. Um, and it was quite a complex data structure. So it was the list of a type list with the first item and the rest, and the rest was again a list, and so on and so on. Um, and uh, there is a shorter way to write that in RDF Turtle, and it's just these um, parentheses um, where you can just list the values in the order that you wish. And this actually represents the linked list. So it is easy to write in RDF Turtle. However, later when we are going to query the data, it is still uh, quite challenging or something to think about when you actually query this kind of data structure because on the RDF triple level, it is still the same data structure. It just looks uh, simpler in the RDF turtle representation. Now, uh, I promised an example where we will combine prefixes um, and relative IRIs in a way that uh, will basically make this document unreadable to people and uh, yeah, uh, the takeaway from that is don't do this, but still let's have a look at what can be done. So <clears throat> the first triple here, A1, B1, C1, well, it uses the lower than and greater than characters. So it is definitely a relative IRI because it doesn't start with the scheme. Uh, now, th this is the beginning of our document. So if we want to see the full URIs, we need to know the base, the base to which these IRIs are relative, and uh, there is no base defined before these three, uh, three, three IRIs. So uh, in that case, the base is either provided to the parser of the document manually, or when this document is published somewhere on the web, it has a URI, and this URI of the document is the base when no other base is specified. Um, right. There is a disadvantage to actually using this fact, 
and that is that when you have this triple a1 b1 c1 and you move the document to some other location you change the triplets inside which is typically undesirable unless there is a special use case for that so it is better whenever you use relative iris to actually explicitly say what the base is and you can do that using at base and specifying the base when you have your base specified and you use a uh, relative iri like this one a2 it is relative to the base that is the last known base this one and uh, that's it then here we have an absolute iri so there is nothing to uh, to talk about here and c2 is again a relative uri uh, relative to the lastly known base. So this actually represents this, uh, this URI. Then we can redefine the base throughout uh, the, the document. So here we have redefined the base and we redefined to what? Well, we redefine it to, and this is a relative URI, relative to what? To the lastly known base, which is this one. So we first need to determine this URI and this will become the new base, like this one. A3, B3, and C3 are again relative URIs, relative to the last known base, which is this one now. Uh, and then we mix it with prefixes. So here we define a prefix. It's the prefix with no name. And we define the prefix using a relative URI, relative to the last known base, which is this one. Uh, and therefore, A4, B4, C4, those are prefixed. Uh, I arise because they do not use the lower than and greater than symbol. So uh, they use this uh, prefix defined by the relative I arise relative to the last in on base. Then we can redefine the prefix uh, using another URI. So the same prefix starts meaning something else. And we can use that prefix um, in the rest of the document. So this can happen in your RDF turtle documents. You can have prefixes redefined, defined using relative IRIs and all that. But since the goal of the RDF turtle representation, the original goal was to make RDF more readable and writable for humans, do not do something like this because a human will get lost in, uh, in this. Right, so we have seen the RDF um, and triples serialization and the RDF turtle serialization. Uh, let's go back to the RDF data model for a little bit and let's have a use case that we'll want to solve somehow using RDF. We have this statement the web page was created by Jakub Pimek. Now, this is not an ideal representation of a person because it should be an entity identified by a URI and so on, but that doesn't matter. Let's say we have this triple and we want to say when we actually obtain this triple and from which web page we got the information. So those are quite basic use cases that we want to address, but there are some problems in uh, representing those in RDF, because how would we go about that? Well, if we want to say something like this came from this web page and we scraped that on this date, we need an identifier for that thing that we want to talk about. We have this triple we want to talk about, but this triple itself does not have any identifier. So we cannot actually do this use case with what we have right now, which is a problem because it is quite a common use case, we want to say, we want to be able to say some metadata about the triples we represent in RDF. So what can be done? Well, there are two things that can be done. The first thing is that we stick to the RDF data model that we have, and we tackle the problem that we had with the triple. And the problem was that the triple itself had no identifier that we could later talk about. So we add the ident identifier to this triple. So the original statement like this, the triple, will become four triples like these. And we'll say, and this is a blank node, but it can be also an IRI, doesn't matter. We'll say, this is an RDF statement. This RDF statement has a subject, something, has a predicate, something, has an object, something. And then we can say it was created on 
and scrapes from and all that uh, all the metadata. This technique went from one triple, we actually have four triples where the triple is given an identifier uh, so that we can use that ident identifier for, for some metadata. This technique is called reification and it is really used like this. It has some disadvantages and one of those, uh, the main one is that from one triple you suddenly have at least four plus the metadata. So you have even more data than before. But it does solve the use case and each triple can be reified like this. And then you can have some metadata about it. There is a second approach uh, because if you do this for each triple, let's say you have a web page and you create 10 triples based on information on that web page in one script that you run at one uh, moment. Then for each triple, you would have to say it comes from this web page and uh, I created it on this date. And those meta uh, metadata statements would be the same for all the triples, uh, which again is kind of a waste of uh, space. So there is another approach. The other approach is called named graphs. What we do here is that we say, okay, we have a set of triples and this set of triples will be our named graph. The set of triples is a graph and we name it. We name it using a URI and therefore this is a named graph. And there is another named graph and another named graph. So now we'll have a set of named graphs. And because those graphs are named, using IRIs, we can say, okay, and this graph was scraped on a date and it was scraped from a web page. We can have all the metadata and it will apply to all the triples within that named graph, saving us the space um, otherwise needed to represent the metadata for each of those triples. There is a catch, of course, because we had RDF triples and the statements were triples and there was no place in the RDF data model to actually put the name of the named graph to which the triple belongs to. So we need to extend the data model. And we extend it in a way that now we do not have RDF triples, we have RDF quads. And each RDF quad has the subject, a predicate, and an object. And then a graph, which is the IRI of the named graph to which this triple belongs to. And then we can use this um, this IRI to attach metadata to this set of triples. Well, okay, so now we have a named graph like this one, we have another named graph like this one, and this graph doesn't have a name and we'll call it a default graph. Um, we define a new term, RDF data set, and RDF data set is a set of named graphs plus one default graph for triples which have no graph assigned. The RDF data set is actually what RDF databases implement. Um, so when you see an implementation of an RDF database, typically it implements an RDF data set. So it will talk about named graphs and a default graph and, and all that. Well, the problem here is that the serializations that we talked about only accounted for RDF triples. And now that we have RDF quads, we need other serializations to represent those. The first one is called n quads, and it is an extension of n triples with the support of the name graph. It is quite a natural extension. So now instead of three IRIs, we have four IRIs, the subject, the predicate, the object, and the IRI of the name graph the three belong to. Uh, it is an extension of n triples. And in the same way, there is an extension of RDF turtle called RDF trig. And again, it is an, quite a natural extension. So the sy syntactically, basically we add two things. We add the graph keyword and we uh, add the curly braces uh, like these. Within the curly braces, there are triples as in RDF turtle. Um, <clears throat> there do not have to be any curly braces and it still can be RDF trig then it is the same as RDF turtle. Uh, but there can be a keyword graph, which is optional, but it can be there. And then an IRI of the name graph to which all the triples within the curly braces belong to. So like this, we can have a file with uh, a set of named graphs, each named graph 
contains a set of RDF triples. And we have all the features known from RDF Turtle. So this is the RDF Trig serialization. Again, a web standard from 2014. Now, there are other RDF serializations, but let's take a break from those for a bit. We will mention them later, but now let's talk about something else. Um, I mentioned vocabularies in the introductory lection, um, uh, lecture, and uh, it, a vocabulary is a set of definitions of predicates to be used in RDF and classes to be used as types with the RDF type predicate to type things. Now, these vocabularies need to be defined somehow. They are both human readable in the form of a documentation of the vocabulary, but they are also machine readable so that you can actually retrieve a name of a property, name of a class, uh, and um, some additional information. And to be able to define the vocabularies, there needs to be a vocabulary that allows you to do that. And that vocabulary, and therefore, the first vocabulary we are going to talk about in, uh, in this course is RDF schema. Now, from the name of the vocabulary, RDF schema, it may uh, give you the impression that it is similar to XML schema or JSON schema, but it is not similar to those actually um, in the way it, it works. It is just a vocabulary. It is not something you can use to validate your data, which is the case in, uh, with uh, XML schema or JSON schema. It is just a vocabulary that allows you to create other vocabularies. Uh, it is again, a web standard it is quite uh, essential part of the uh, RDF data model, but it is separate because it is a vocabulary uh, which uses some new uh, classes and, uh, and predicates that allow us to define classes and predicates. And uh, let's talk about RDF schema on an example. So here we are going to establish or define some RDF classes that we can later use in our data. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, the domain of cars, vehicles. And here we'll say we'll have a class motor vehicle that we later want to use in our data to say, I own a motor vehicle, for instance. Um, and the motor vehicle is of a type. And this is now what I'm talking about. I want to establish or define that class for motor vehicle. How, how, how do I do that? Well, I say, okay, motor vehicle is of a type RDFS class. Like this, I say, this is a class that can be later used as a class in data. So quite simple. So I do that for a motor vehicle, for a passenger vehicle, for a van, truck, a minivan, and I can have different classes defined in my new cars vocabulary. And later I can say, I have this green car, which is a motor vehicle. I have this blue car, which is a minivan and so on. Um, there is one thing that RDFS allows us to do with classes and that is uh, create a subclass hierarchy. So I can say that a passenger vehicle is a subclass of a motor vehicle. This means that every instance of a passenger vehicle is also an instance of a motor vehicle. We can take, uh, we can look at this as sets. So we basically say that passenger vehicles are subsets of motor vehicles. Vans are subclasses of motor vehicle and trucks also. And then we can have a minivan, which is a subclass of van and also a subclass of a passenger vehicle. When I um, denote this graphically, we have this minivan, which is a subclass of a van, subclass of a passenger vehicle, and passenger vehicle and van and truck are all subclasses of uh, a motor vehicle. And it means that every minivan is also a van, also a passenger vehicle, and also a motor vehicle. Any questions uh, to defining classes? Yeah, so I do this so that in my RDF data, I can say, this green car with this registration plate is a minivan using RDF type. Now, the second part of RDFS is um, defining predicates so that I can say or define the edges that are used in the graph 
to connect nodes uh, and a node to a uh, literal. Uh, let's have a person class here. And we all want to say uh, that, uh, let's say, a book has an author and the author is a person. So we have a class person here already defined. And now we say we'll use a property author. It is of a type property. Uh, and uh, with properties, we can say the domain and the range of that property because properties typically go from subjects to objects. The subjects are of a certain type, class. The objects are of a certain type. And therefore, those types of subjects are domain and the types of objects are range. So here I say that every author is a person by saying that the property author has a range person which means that every object connected uh, using this predicate is of a type person. Another example, has mother. So has mother is a property. It has a range female because every mother is a female and it has a domain person because everyone has a mother. Um, now, <clears throat> the way predicates work in our new schema is different from how you can uh, imagine from uh, let's say the object oriented uh, programming approach because as you can see the properties are first class citizens here they can exist regardless of any classes if i imagine just this triple i say that his mother is a property and when i say this i can start using that predicate and no classes need to exist so this is different from uh, how it is in object-oriented programming, where we have classes and the classes have attributes and uh, they belong to the class. Now, this is different. We have classes and we have properties and they are completely separate. We can say about the property, uh, what is the range and the domain, but we do not have to, but we can. Uh, and then the effect is that actually when someone, um, let's say, has a mother, in the data, it means that they are instances of person. And when someone is a mother in the data, then that it means that they are instances of uh, the class female, um, but that's it. Okay, so those are properties connecting nodes, things in RDF. Then we have properties that actually connect a literal value to a node. And in that case, the range is the IRI of the data type typically from XML schema. So here we have age, which is a property. And then we say that the range of age is integer from XML schema. And therefore, whenever we use age, we use it with integer values. Now there is one warning here, and uh, that is about this weight property. This one is actually uh, defined in a way that is, well, unusual and probably wrong. Why is that? Well, the reasoning behind these two triples is in my data, I have representations of books and I also have representations of motor vehicles. In both cases, I want to say that a book weighs something and a motor vehicle weighs something. It seems like uh, the same property. So let's have just one property for that with this URI. And let's say that I use this property with books, so the domain is book, and I use this property also with motor vehicles, so the domain is a motor vehicle, and uh, that's it. Well, actually, this is typically wrong, because what this means is whenever some subject has the weight predicate with some value, it is an instance of a book, and it is an instance of a motor vehicle which is improbable, typically wrong. So you cannot do this. The solution to this is, well, there are two solutions. Either you want separate properties for separate occasions, or you want to say that actually books and vehicles are uh, subclasses of something that has a weight, and the domain then is this superclass of those two. Um, so those are the two solutions to this problem, but this is definitely wrong. Uh, <clears throat> now, similarly to the subclassing relation of, uh, uh, of among classes, um, we have 
a sub-property of relation in RDF schema. So here we have a driver, it's a property. We have a primary driver, also a property. So now we'll have a car and uh, the car will have a set of drivers assigned. And one of those drivers will be a primary driver. Um, well, since primary driver is a sub-property of driver, well, it means that whenever someone is a primary driver, they are also a driver. It's the same as with the classes. There is another view that can help with this. And it is again, based on set theory. So we have the class person. It's a set of all people. We have a, a class motor vehicle. And again, it's a set of all vehicles. Now we have the driver um, predicate, which is a set of all pairs, a person and motor vehicle that are in the relation that the person is a driver of that vehicle. And then primary driver is again, a set of pairs where the first part of the pair is a person and the second part of the pair is a motor vehicle. And the pair is in the relation that the person is the primary driver of the motor vehicle. And when we look at the predicate as a, a set of pairs, then the primary driver is a subset of the driver set of pairs that are connected using those relations. Um, right, in RDFS, there are some properties also defined that we should use when we are defining our vocabulary because uh, up to now, we talked just about the URIs. So we had URIs defined for classes and predicates. We had subclasses and sub properties, but <clears throat> There is also the human readable part of the vocabulary that we need to provide. And therefore, for each class and predicate that we define, we should include a label and a description uh, using RDFS comment, um, which contains a human readable representation of that thing that we just defined. Then we can also say that a resource, and this, is, this one can be used regardless of vocabularies. So this RDFS C also says basically there is a resource which can give you more data about what you are looking at. So you can say this using RDFS also. And RDFS is defined by actually points from an RDF resource to typically a document that defines that resource. So it is quite usual that classes and predicates point using is defined by to the human readable document that accompanies each vocabulary. Um, there is an example of RDFS uh, vocabulary. So let's say that we want to properly define the motor vehicles vocabulary. Uh, we do, do that in RDF Turtle. And here we have the vocabulary. We have our class for motor vehicles with the label in multiple languages and a description again in multiple uh, languages. Then we have a passenger vehicle, which is a subclass of the motor vehicle. Then we have the property with domain and range defined and uh, primary driver, a sub property of driver again with, uh, with label defined. And on the right hand side, we can see how we can use this newly defined vocabulary in the data. So we have a car, which is a passenger vehicle and has a primary driver. And then we have another vehicle, which also has a primary driver and so on. So on the left hand side, an example of an RDFS vocabulary on the right hand side, an example of usage of that vocabulary in data. Now, <clears throat> one thing that we can talk about here is that these triples can be explicitly stated in the data, but other triples can be inferred from the explicitly stated ones. For instance, we have uh, that uh, uh, EXR1 is a passenger vehicle. But because passenger vehicle is a subclass of a motor vehicle, we can also infer that EXR1 is a motor vehicle from the knowledge of the RDFS vocabulary. Um, and uh, the same goes for EXR2. And then since EXR1 has a primary driver and we have the sub property of here, we can infer that EXR1 also has a driver and the same goes for EXR2 here. So those are triples that are not explicitly stated in the vocabulary, but can be inferred from uh, in the data, but can, can be inferred from the data or reason from the data based on the knowledge 
of the RDFS vocabulary. Um, yeah, so this technique called uh, inference or reasoning and uh, some, um, let's say, applications or databases know how to do this, some do not. So you kind of need to know what you are going to be working with. If you want to, for instance, query this kind of data using a query like give me all uh, instances of a motor vehicle. Because if you have these triples and you ask the query instances of all motor vehicles, then you may get zero results if the application does not understand the vocabulary, or you can get two results when the application actually infers those triples and uses them to answer your query. <clears throat> right. So that was our new schema and how you can use it to create your own vocabulary. Now, uh, I'll get back to one more RDF uh, serialization, which is, however, a quite an important one because it gains traction uh, recently and it is slowly but surely becoming the main RDF serialization used on the web. And this one is called JSON LE, uh, JSON for Link Data. The, the goal of JSON LE is to actually make the data usable for two kinds of uh, developers. The first kind wants to load the data as RDF and use it as linked data. <coughs> and for them, the JSON early serialization will behave as any other. So they will use an RDF enabled library to load the data and see the graph uh, represented in the serialization. But then there is a second kind of developers who do not want to work with uh, RDF or linked data. They want to work with uh, regular JSON. And for them, the file should look like uh, the normal JSON as much as possible without any RDF specifics. So <clears throat> here in this example, we have an example of such a normal JSON. This is a JSON representation of uh, someone's profile with a name, a homepage, <clears throat> and a image URL. Now, if um, I, as a regular JSON developer, get this, I'm quite happy because I can translate or imagine what these mean and process the data in my application. If I want to take a look at this data as a uh, link data, then I am missing something. I do not know which predicate is this, which predicate is this, which one is this. Uh, and uh, I don't even know whether these strings should be interpreted as IRIs of things or as uh, literal values. Um, and uh, those, are, those differences are quite important from the RDF point of view. And therefore I need some information that will help me actually help the library I'm uh, going to be using. Um, and uh, these additional uh, pieces of information are hidden in what is called a context. So a JSON-LD serialization typically has a normal JSON path, and then a JSON-LD context that contains all the mapping from the normal JSON to RDF. So all information missing from JSON to be uh, to be to be readable as RDF is hidden in uh, in the context. Now there is a structural difference between JSON and the RDF graph model because JSON is a tree um, structure, and we want to make a, um, well a generate graph out of that. Uh, but that's okay because tree is a special uh, special case of a general graph structure. <clears throat> And uh, normally, or typically, it will mean uh, that uh, in JSON, we have uh, JSON objects. Those will be nodes in our RDF graph. And the uh, values in the JSON objects will be predicates. And uh, well, the value names actually will be predicates. And the values will be either <coughs> literal values or identifiers of other things in the graph. So uh, let's uh, uh, take a look at some of the specifics um, that are um, contained in, uh, in the specification of JSON-LD. One more observation 
all the JSON-ID keywords start with the at symbol. So you can spot them quite easily uh, with the at symbol, it's a JSON-ID keyword. And uh, the most visible one is the context, uh, which is always present in a JSON-ID file. Uh, now it is a web standard. Again, uh, the last update, JSON-ID 1.1 is from 2020. So it is still quite recent. <clears throat> and when you want to play with JSON-ID, there is a playground, which is a web application, and you can paste your JSON-ID file and see what it represents in any quads periodization. Right, so let's have a regular JSON like this. Uh, we'll have a JSON object and uh, it will contain name with some name. So the first thing we are missing is the identifier, the IRI of that, JSON, of, of that object represented um, in, in the graph. So we add it using the at ID keyword and the at ID keyword means that the object represented by this JSON object is identified by this IRI. And therefore, uh, all that is missing is the mapping of the name value uh, to a predicate. And we do that in the context. We say name for us is a predicate with this IRI schema.org slash name. Like this, we have all the necessary information to represent the JSON value or the JSON document in RDF. We know that we are talking about a node with this IRI and uh, we have the mapping of name to schema.org slash name and we have the value which stays the same. In this case, it will be of the type string, but uh, we can deal with that later. <clears throat> so here already we have a simple mapping to an RDF uh, triple. Yeah. I'm not sure if I follow. So now I use the at ID keyword in the JSON, in the data part, basically, and not in the context. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I will get to that, but uh, yes. Yeah, I say that name is this predicate, but I'm not able to actually uh, say what will be the types of the values connected using this predicate. Um, <clears throat> I can do uh, a more in-depth definition like this. So here I say, there is another uh, value that uh, is mapped to a predicate using ID like this. That's the same as saying it right away without the ID. But when I make it an object, I can say, and the type is, and this means that uh, actually the value is an uh, IRI of a RDF resource. So this is a more complex definition. This is a simpler definition of the mapping of a JSON value to a predicate. So this IRI is a similar definition to this one with the ID, uh, but here I can say more. I can say that uh, the, the type of this from the RDF point of view is that this actually represents an IRI of an RDF resource. It is not a literal value. So that's the type ID. Uh, that means that this is interpreted as another RDF resource and not just a string that looks like a URI. <clears throat> right, uh, the next thing I want to say is that this object is of a certain type. So that's the RDF type predicate connecting it to an IRI of a class. And I can do that using the at type keyword uh, with the IRI of the, of the class. So now I know that this JSON object actually represents a thing identified by this IRI of a type schema.org slash restaurant. Um, I can do the same with uh, multiple types. So I can say that this is actually a restaurant and a brewery by using JSON uh, array. So that's fine. <clears throat> but there is uh, one slight problem 
Uh, and that is that I said before that we want to make the data part of the JSON as much normal as possible. And now we have S type, and then we have two IRIs, which is not something JSON developers are used to, but we can hide some of this in the context. So in the context, we can say that for us, whenever IRI is expected and I see just restaurant, it means that I actually mean schema.org slash restaurant. And whenever I see just brewery, it means this full IRI. Therefore, this is actually the same as here when I hide the mapping of the constant here to the, to the full IRI in the context. So I can say I have this thing with this ID and the type is restaurant and brewery. And in the context, I get that restaurant is this IRI and brewery is this IRI. So I can hide some of it in the context. I can also use relative IRIs. We talked about those in RDF Turtle. So I can say, okay, when, wherever in JSONRD I expect IRIs, they will be relative to some base. And then I can see this uh, ID, which is empty, but it is actually relative to the base. Therefore, uh, it represents this IRI. So those are relative IRIs. Uh, <clears throat> when we are going to talk about schema.org, which is one of the vocabularies, uh, this will make more sense, but it may happen that within majority of the document, I use just one vocabulary. And therefore I can say, okay, I use this vocabulary throughout the document. And then I can say just type is restaurant and name. And I do not need to map those, especially in the context because uh, I have it mapped to, um, or I interpret it as schema.org slash name and schema.org slash restaurant. Thanks to, uh, thanks to this uh, vocabulary. But it makes sense only when one vocabulary is used in, uh, in the whole uh, document. Now, there may be a situation when uh, the JSON file actually contains something that I do not want to see in the RDF representation. Then I can, in the context, uh, define it as null, and therefore I will not get it when I uh, parse this as, uh, as RDF. <clears throat> I can use um, something that in JSONRD is called compact IRIs, but it is the same principle as prefixed IRIs in RDF Turtle. So we have already seen this, that uh, in the context, I can name an IRI using uh, some, some, some name. So again, I can name uh, IRI using, let's say, false, and then I can use it with the comma, uh, with the colon symbol, uh, and wherever in JSONRD an IRI is expected, and I use the name that is defined in the context with a colon symbol, it works as a prefixed IRI. <clears throat> now, this is a bit dangerous because if I see this and I expect an IRI of a type of a path here, if I see this and I do not find the definition of fault in the context, then I do not know that this actually should be a compact IRI, and I interpret it as an absolute IRI where the schema of that IRI is not HTTP or HTTPS, but it is false because this is a syntactically valid URI with this as a schema, unless this is mapped in the context. So it is a bit, uh, bit dangerous here. Um, now, this is the more complex definition of the mapping of uh, a value from JSON to RDF. Uh, where we can say that modified is a predicate identified by this with the ID and the values are actually um, date times from uh, which are date types from the XML schema. So like this, uh, I can have modified and a date time in the JSON file and in RDF, I can see it connected using the proper predicate and having uh, the right um, data type specified in RDF because in RDF, as I mentioned, we always have literal values with the string and the data type or a string and language tag. Now in JSON, it's quite typical that we have uh, one JSON object nested in another one. So we have one person who knows another person and the other people that the first person knows are nested in the JSON object of the first person. 
Um, this is quite naturally supported in RDF. So this JSON object is connected to the inner JSON object using uh, the nodes, which then in context is mapped to something. Here it is mapped to both nodes. Since here we have no ID and here we also have no ID, those will be translated as uh, blank nodes because we are missing the at ID identifiers of those objects. So we have a blank node with a name, who knows, a blank node of a type person with a, with a name. If we add it at ID here, then the ID would, the, the um, IRI would appear uh, in the RD representation. <clears throat> uh, the scoping also applies to context. So I can redefine uh, mapping in a context for a embedded JSON object. Here we have a name of a person as a, uh, as a top level name definition. So here we have a JSON object with a name, Marcus Lanthaler. And we have in the context uh, mapping to person name. That's what we can see here. But then we have the details. Uh, and within details, we have another context, which actually redefines name to a name of an organization. And therefore, this name is actually a name of the organization using a proper predicate. So something that seems the same from the JSON point of view, because we have a name here and a name here, can be mapped to two different predicates in RDF using scoped contexts. Um, speaking of uh, literal values, I already showed you how to deal with data types. And now we need to deal with the language tags so that we are able to say that this text is actually a text in a certain language. We can do this using at language in the context. This defines a default language for all values um, uh, in the JSON-RD file. We can do it scoped to a uh, predicate mapping like this. So name with nothing will actually be a string because we say that language is null. So the result will be a machine readable string. Occupation, we have no definition here. So it will be in Japanese because the default applies. Occupation N has a language defined as English and occupation CS has a language defined as Czech. So then when we have this in the JSON data, we actually, uh, the result is literals with the appropriate language tags in RDF. Um, however, that was not, again, the ideal way of representing different languages in JSON. Uh, the typical way is like this. So we have occupation and then we have an object where the value names are the codes of the languages and the values are the text in that language. However, this structurally does not correspond to the RDF, the JSON to RDF mapping algorithm. Uh, so there is a special support and we say occupation is a container uh, language like this. And therefore this object is translated uh, appropriately to the RDF representation. So this is the Japanese occupation, English and Czech occupation of, of this person. With this, uh, with this name. Right. Um, yeah, so um, we are kind of running out of time, but uh, I think we can make it actually. So a couple more minutes. Um, yeah, we have the support for multiple values uh, in JSON. In JSON, when you see an array, you can actually access the first item, the second item, and the third item of that array. However, I mentioned that in RDF, there is no ordering among triples. Well, if you translate this uh, into RDF, you really lose the ordering of the individual items as default. If you want to preserve it, you need to specify that explicitly using at list, and this means that this list will be uh, represented as the linked list that we talked about in RDF. Uh, the default is that you lose the ordering because uh, actually um, accessing the array items in order is not that common. Um, so that's the default that you lose it. And uh, if you want to preserve it, uh, use the, the list. Uh, <clears throat> another problem uh, with uh, that, that can happen when you translate JSON into RDF is 
with the direction of the predicate. And the problem is uh, that uh, JSON is a tree structure that goes from the root to the embedded um, embedded objects. And therefore, uh, on, the, on the example of the Simpsons, when we have Homer as a root, and we want to say that Homer has two children, uh, Bart and Lisa, and all uh, we have to work with is, is, is the relation in the other direction, that actually we have a parent predicate and not the child predicate, uh, then we have a problem because it's the other direction than the embedding in the JSON file. Uh, so one thing we can do is we can uh, flatten the JSON file and have Homer, Bart, and Lisa represented separately uh, with a link represent, uh, to Homer represented like this. So this is the predicate and this is the ID of Homer, but that's not the ideal way because um, it affects the JSON structure. Another thing we can do is we can say this embedding of the JSON objects is in reverse. So this helps a little bit because here we have Homer and Homer has two children as sub, uh, sub objects um, with the reverse um, of this property indicated here like this. But again, it is usage of JSON LD keywords in the normal JSON uh, part. So it's not that ideal. The ideal solution is like this. We actually say that the mapping of children from JSON is the reverse to this predicate. And then it works as expected. So here Homer has children, Bart and Lisa. And we know that the children is actually mapped to the reverse of parent. And therefore in RDF, we have Bart and Lisa who both have a parent Homer. JSON LD is not just a triples format. It also supports RDF quads, uh, where uh, <clears throat> using the uh, add graph keyword. Um, so the JSON array in the add graph keyword contains the triples representation and the ID at the same level as the graph keyword gives the IRI to the named graph to which the triples in the graph uh, array belong. Now, we have talked about the fact that JSON-RD is um, focused on both JSON developers and RDF developers. The JSON developers do not need to know what is in the JSON-RD context. However, the JSON-RD context still makes it possible for regular RDF libraries to load the file as a regular RDF file. And the goal is to make the normal JSON part of JSON-RD as normal as possible for regular JSON developers. Now we have used a lot of those keywords with the at symbol um, and uh, that might be of some concern to the JSON developers. However, we can hide this from the developers by uh, aliasing those keywords in the json -LD context. So here what we can see is that uh, we name at id as url, at type as type, and uh, we create an alias for the fourth person um, IRI denoting the class used for people in the full vocabulary and we uh, name it as person. Then in the normal JSON part, we can see URL type. The value of the type is the word person uh, and it looks all very normal. At the same time, the mapping to RDF triples is preserved via the mapping in the context. Now, if the JSON developers would be concerned with seeing so uh, those those big values uh, of the context key. We can hide the whole context in a remote location and just link to it from the JSON object using a URL. So the JSON that we see now is a regular JSON plus one key value uh, pointing to the JSON early context, and all the mapping to RDF is hidden away in another. Uh, JSON RD file. If even this would be too much, then uh, we can hide the JSON LD mapping altogether, uh, given that the JSON file is published somewhere on the web and we access it using the HTTP protocol. In that case, uh, we have a normal regular JSON with no alterations whatsoever. Uh, and uh, then when we get this JSON file using HTTP, 
we can see in the response header that there is link to the JSON-RD context uh, if we are interested. And uh, RDF libraries, when they see this link, they use it to download the context and interpret the JSON as RDF, whereas regular JSON developers do not have to concern themselves with this and they, they see just a regular JSON file. So now we have talked about actually five of the seven standard RDF serializations. We talked about entriples, then the more human readable turtle, then nquads and trig, and we talked about JSON-RD. Uh, I mentioned also RDFA, which is one of the seri uh, which is a serialization that uh, uh, enables developers to serialize RDF triples in HTML files. And the last standard syntax is RDF XML, which is RDF graphs serialized into uh, XML documents. Now, this serialization is the oldest one. So it was there when RDF started as a standard in 2004. And uh, at that time, it basically meant that everyone who wanted to work with RDF needed to learn both XML and RDF and how the regular or the, the generic RDF graph can be serialized into the tree-shaped XML file. This uh, was perceived as too difficult by some developers and it made RDF uh, quite unpopular at that time uh, unnecessarily. Well, let's have a look. We are talking about an XML file here. So it has one root element, which is the RDF element. And inside that element, there are RDF description blocks, each describing a certain subject. The subject IRI is noted in the RDF about attribute. And then inside the description block, we have individual XML elements representing predicates. Uh, and they either have a literal as an object, then uh, it is represented by the content of the XML element, or the object is actually identified by an IRI, and then uh, the RDF resource attribute is used for that. Of course, there is uh, support for blank nodes uh, in the form of the RDF node ID attributes, which contain the local ID of the blank node. And uh, there is support for data types of literals via the RDF data type attribute where we have the IRI of the data type. One uh, peculiarity that is sometimes used in RDF XML is uh, the usage of XML entities, which can be seen in the bottom part of the slide, uh, where XML entities can be defined to represent prefixes. And the usage of the prefixes like this can be seen on the bottom of the slide with the ampersand and the semicolon representing the XML entity, which represents a certain prefix used uh, in the document. The only reasonable use case for RDF XML can be seen now in the slide, which is when for some reason we, we want to have a piece of an XML document represented as is in an RDF literal. In this example, we have a triple book one, two, three, four, five has title and the title is the XML element span that we can see in the um, element with the parse type literal. So if for some reason we need to have this, have XML documents or parts of them as uh, literals in RDF, then RDF XML can be used as a serialization that allows doing this quite nicely and naturally. Otherwise, it is uh, more or less deprecated now.